So today I want to talk about we need a, re a, a real relationship. We need a relationship with Jesus. Amen. And <clears throat> last Sunday, Brother David was preaching on John 4 and the Samaritan woman. And all week I've been reading just that little chunk where Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman and where he goes to the village and everything. And God wouldn't let me go away from it he like anytime i'd start to try to think about anything else scripture wise he'd be like no i want you to focus on this i'm like okay god what do you want <laughs> what do you want <laughs> what do you want me to to realize and he was like you need an experience you need a, a relationship with me to really understand what i'm trying to do and this Last night I sat down after being at mom and daddy's house. We we had fellowship with one another. We ate some fish and it was really good. <laughs> it was it was just a good time. And I started thinking about when I was in college, I had a relationship with my family, but I didn't really have a true relationship with my family because I was away all the time. I was still their son. I was still Joseph's brother, but I didn't have fellowship with them. Yeah. When we had dinner, it was usually me making some pita pockets or I went to the Mexican place and ate <laughs> with my friends. I had a relationship with other people. And I, I think about that's a lot of us with Jesus. We know him. We know of him. We know all of these things, but we don't have a real relationship. And... Guy was just kind of just putting this on my heart. My favorite athlete is LeBron James. I love LeBron James. He is amazing. He is the best basketball player, and I'll fight you for that. <laughs> He's awesome. And he has done amazing things in the NBA and outside the NBA. I can give you stats. I can tell you whatever team he's played for. I can tell you how many championships he's won. I can do all of these things. But if you went to LeBron today and asked, Who's Zach Dykes? He'd be like, who are you talking about? Yeah. He wouldn't know me from Adam. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't know me. So there, there is a relationship, but it's from me being a fan of him. Because LeBron doesn't know me. Would I love for LeBron to know me? Oh, yeah. I would love to be LeBron's friend. I would love to have that kind of relationship with him. And maybe one day <laughs> that will happen but at the moment, that is not our relationship. On the other hand, Jesus wants that relationship with us. Yes. He's, he's the best. He's got the best stat record that there ever was. Amen. He's the only one that's got crucified and come back from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to be his friend even more than I want to be LeBron's friend. So let's go to John 4 and 5. Because as Christians, I lived most of my life knowing Jesus, but I didn't really have a relationship with him. I didn't have a relationship with him. There was nothing there. It was just, oh, I know him. I know the stories. I know his miracles. I knew his stats. I knew his stats. I could give you his stat sheets. I could give you all of these things, but there was nothing there. I didn't feel anything. Other than conviction. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you this morning. And as Christians, I, I said I was a Christian all my life. But I had no relationship. But until recently, I've become a disciple. I've become more disciplined in my relationship with God. We can claim to be Christians but do a lot of things. Yeah. But we have to have a relationship. We're going to start in verse 5 this morning. Jesus arrived at the Samaritan village of Sakar near the field of Jacob had given to his son Joseph long ago. Wearied by his long journey, he sat on the edge of Jacob's well. He sent his disciples into the village to buy food, for it was already afternoon. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink of water. Surprised, she said, why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Jesus replied, if you only knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you, you'd ask me 
for a drink, and I would give you living water. Jesus doesn't play by the rule book. He's breaking all sorts of norms, okay? The Jews and Samaritans, they didn't get along at all. The Jews thought they were right. The Samaritans thought they were right. Does that sound like any of us? Alabama, Auburn, Florida, FSU, any, any, there's always a divide with humans. Democrats, Republicans, there's always a divide. There's division. But he wasn't supposed to talk to her because one, she was a Samaritan. That was bad enough. But two, she was a woman. That just wasn't how it was. So she wasn't just the low of the low, she was lower than low. Okay, that's how they thought back then. But he could have stayed silent, like I have many times in my life, when someone brings something up, when I could have said something to lift somebody up. He could have stayed silent, but what did he do? He spoke to her. He started a conversation. And last time I checked, that's how a relationship starts, is with a conversation. Okay, I worked with a lot of people at Gulf Breeze that I never even talked to. Never even said a single word to, but they were my colleagues. And that's as far as it went. They worked in the same buildings that I worked in, and that's as far as it went. I never said anything to them. And they could have been good as gold, but I never would have known it because I didn't say anything to them. And Jesus could have done that as well. But he was willing to get out of the norms. He was willing to get uncomfortable. Are we willing to get uncomfortable? Because it gets, it gets further in here. And we're going to go to verse 11 now. The woman replied, But sir, you don't even have a bucket, and this well is very deep. So where do you find this living water? Do you really think that you are greater than our sister, our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from him it himself, along with his children and livestock. She calls him out right there. Do you think you're better than Jacob? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think you're better than him? And Jesus answered, If you drink from Jacob's well, you'll be thirsty again and again. But if you anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again, and will be forever satisfied. For when you drink the water I give you, I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, Amen. springing up and flooding you with endless life. I preach right there. <laughs> I want that. I want that. Then the woman replied, let me drink that water so I'll never be thirsty again and won't have to come back here to draw water. Now, just right there, she wants it. She don't really understand what it is, but she's like, if I ain't got to keep going up to this hill and getting this water, I'm all for it. <laughs> I remember when Ivan hit and we had horses and everything, and we'd have to go down to one of our ponds and fill up five-gallon buckets to water the horses. Man, I hated that. I hated that. We'd get down there, five-gallon water, bring it up there, and they'd suck it dry as soon as you put it in the trough. So I can only imagine how this woman felt having to go to the well all the time, getting water, getting water. Thankfully, we don't live in that kind of era, but he's offering water that can satisfy not just for a moment, but forever. Jesus said, go to get your husband and bring him back here. She replied, but I'm not married. That's true, Jesus said, for you've been married five times and now you're living with a man who is not your husband. You have told the truth. Now, that part right there, that was a test. That was a test. Was it Jesus trying to set her up to fail? No, he was giving her an opportunity to be honest, to be forthcoming. And guess what? It doesn't, Jesus didn't judge her. He didn't say, you harlot, you Jezebel. (laughs) But how many times, and I've done this, when I hear somebody say something, when they're honest, guess what? My flesh starts trying to judge them. Oh, well, did you hear what they did? You know, you know what they've been doing? 
on Saturday night? We've been there. It's that flesh coming in there. But Jesus, he says, you have told the truth. And that's it. He's like, thank you for honesty. He already knew. He already knew, but he was willing to take it at face value. You are honest with me. Verse 19, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me this. Why do our fathers worship God here on this nearby mountain, but your people teach that Jerusalem is the place where we must worship, which is right. She's curious now. Jesus has devel started developing a rapport with her. That's what he wants to do with this, us. He's not wanting to you know, stand up on heaven like Zeus and throw lightning bolts because we're bad people. He's a loving God. He wants to love us. He wants to draw us near. Jesus responded, Believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you won't worship the Father on a mountain, nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart. You people don't really know the one they worship. Your people don't really know the one they worship. We Jews worship out of experience, for it's, it, for it's from the Jews the salvation is made available. From here on, worshiping the Father with all with worshiping the Father will not be the matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit, and He longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore Him in the realm of the Spirit and truth. Yes. That's a lot to unpack right there. <laughs> That's a lot to unpack. So we'll go with the very first part. She's asking about Samaritans, Jews. They're, they're worrying on philosophies, theologies. Oh, where do we worship? How do we worship? Have we heard that before? Yeah. Well, we've got we to gotta do it this way. We've got to do it that way. Guess what? It don't matter. <laughs> God, God wants us to have a real relationship. It doesn't matter how you worship as long as it's sincere in your heart. You could be the most expressive person. You could be more... In inner worshiping with God. It doesn't matter as long as it's sincere. It doesn't matter if someone's running across the room yelling and screaming as long as it's sincere. You could be silent, not saying a word, and worship God with your spirit. So she's wondering, what's right? Because she's heard it both ways. The Jews look down on the Samaritans. The Samaritans are like, this is what we know. We've all been there. We've all experienced, well, this is what I was taught. This is what I've seen. What, what is right? Get in the Word. Yeah. Ask God. He's going to tell you. Because Jesus replied to her. He didn't go, well, it's not for you to know. Yeah. He said it. He was like, this is how it's going. This is what it's supposed to be about. He's blunt. He's like, your people are wrong. The Jews are wrong. This is the way it's going to be. That's what we need to be. We need to start cutting the fat out of this thing. We need to start cutting the religious spirit out of the church. That's why so many people have went away. That's why so many people, I don't want to go to church on Sunday because I'm going to get beat over the head with the Bible. Or we're going to have to, oh, when they sing that song, oh my gosh, it's so slow, but they sing it every Sunday. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. It's people don't want tradition. They want relationship. Yeah, amen. Especially, it's anybody, but the younger people, they want something that's real. Yeah. They're looking for something that's real. The world is crying out for something that's real, and we've got to give it to them. Because they're going to find a counterfeit one way or another. Oh, yeah. They're going to find it in something, and we've got to be ready to give it the right things. Yeah. What are our priorities? What are we feeding ourselves or exalting? Are we concerning ourselves with worry, anxiety, depression? If that's so, then we're worshiping those things. We're not worshiping God. Last night, I was sitting in bed, and I started thinking, oh, man, because I got a, a meeting with one of my clients Monday. I was like, man, I hope he signs that contract because I need money. And I started saying it, and Amy's like, shut up. 
She's like, you don't need to be talking about that. She's like, we're not worrying about money. But that was the thing. Like, I literally had sat down not an hour before that and wrote out all my notes. I'm like, ah, Jesus, Jesus. Then I get in bed. It's like, oh, Lord, I need money. He's like, I'm here. I got it taken care of. Thankfully, I have a wife that will call me out on those things. But if that's what we're focused on, then that's what we're going to get. That worry, anxiety, it's just going to keep feeding itself. But if we're worshiping God with a sincere heart, then that's what we're going to get. We're going to get God. I'd much rather have God than worry. Oh, I I just, he knows our heart's desires. Daddy was talking about that this morning. He knows our heart's desires. If he knows that, he's wanting to give it to us. Daddy knows what I want. He's known it for a while. When I was 16, he knew I wanted, well, it was like 14. He knew it for a long time. I wanted a Mustang. Guess what? I got a Mustang. And then I got another Mustang. And then I got another Mustang. It's because I like Mustangs. (laughs) He knew the desire of my heart. He fulfilled them. That's what God wants. Because me and my father have a real relationship. And that's what he wants for us. So... There are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There is a direct connection. It's, Daddy could never get me saved. As good of a preacher as he is, he could never get me saved. Mama couldn't either. Sending me text messages in, in the morning. Here's a Bible scripture, believe the blood of Jesus and all of this. And I'd be like, <laughs> like the conviction fall on me. I'd like, just shh. Be quiet. <laughs> and I go about my day, but those scriptures were planting seeds because they were the word of God. They were prophesying into my life of who I was supposed to be. And that's what we've got to have. Let's go to verse 25. And this part, this part is all of us. <laughs> the woman said, this is all confusing. <laughs> this is all confusing. I don't know... But I do know that the anointing one is coming, the true Messiah, and when he comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. Jesus said to her, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. The anointing one is here speaking with you. I am the one you're looking for. Praise the good Lord that he's here. He's 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 already taken care of it. He's done. The woman didn't understand anything. And there's so many times when I've read the word, I'm just like, God, I don't know what you were trying to tell me in here. I can tell it's like, the more confusing it is, I think the better the word is. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) The better the word is. The more confusing, it's like, okay, God, I know I'm going to need your wisdom to understand this. So you just ask. It talks about that in Proverbs. If you need wisdom, all you got to do is ask, and he will give it to you. We talked about that in Sunday school a few months ago. So you have to ask for God's wisdom. Jesus was already answering questions. Anytime that lady had a a question, guess what? He didn't go, ah, whatever. You know. Have you ever heard that? You ask somebody a question, they start explaining it, and they can't explain it. And they're like, you know. I'm I'm one of the world's worst about it. It was like, I started explaining it like, well, you know. And they're like, no. Amy was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like you know and i just say you know enough until she's like whatever (laughs) jesus isn't like that he's got the answers verse 28 all at once the woman dropped her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone come and meet a man at the well who told me everything i've ever done he could be the anointed one we've been waiting for Hearing this, the people came streaming out of the village to go see Jesus. Now, for this woman to be excited that someone that she's never seen aired her dirty laundry out, that had to say a lot to the people of the village. One, that the guy knew who she was and what she did, and that she was excited about it. Because I'm sure if Jesus bebopped in and was like, started talking to me i didn't know it was him and he was like yeah you've you've done this 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 you know i'd be like oh shh, 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 don't not a lot of us would be running down the street saying those things 
But she was. She was excited that they were no longer going to live in shame. They were no longer going to live in being unequal to everyone around them. There was a real relationship starting there. So the people, when they heard that, they're like, something's going on. I want to go see what's going on. I want to get a piece of that. If she's that excited about somebody saying this to her, i got to go meet that person. As the crowds emerge, we're in verse 35 now. As the crowds emerge from the village, Jesus said to his disciples, Why would you say the harvest is another four months away? Look at all the people coming. Now is harvest time. For their hearts are like vast fields of ripened grain, ready for a spiritual harvest. And everyone who reaps these souls for eternal life will receive a reward. And those who plant spiritual seeds and those who reap the harvest will celebrate together with great joy. And this confirms the saying, One sows the seed and another reaps the harvest. I have sent you out to be a harvest to harvest a field that you haven't planted, where many others have labored long hard before you, and now you are the privilege to profit from the labors and reap the harvest. So right there, all these people came. And Jesus to the disciples now, the disciples, they're feeling uneasy. They're a bunch of Jews in Samaria. And they see all these Samaritans coming out. Now, if you've ever been in a place where you shouldn't be, and you see a bunch of people start coming at you, what do you start thinking? I'm about to get messed up. (laughs) I'm about to get messed up. So I'm sure the disciples are like, they're on high alert. They're already, Jesus hanging out with this woman, talking to this woman. They're like, okay, this is weird. And then all these people start coming out. They're probably like, all right. We're going to call fire down from heaven. They already, <laughs> already tried that once. <laughs> but they're, they're on high alert. But Jesus is like, no, this is time. This is time to start breaking down the norms. Start, it's time to cut the fat. We've got a job to do. So they had to get past their, their fleshly eyes. They had to get into the right spirit and see these people for what they are. Because they can have been like, I ain't, I ain't talking to them. They're Samaritans. Okay? And there's been times when somebody will come up and want to talk to me. I'm like, how are you doing? Like, I, I, sometimes I have to force myself to talk to somebody because my mind's like, well, you know what they did. You, know, da, 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 da. you look at how they're dressed and all of these things or where they're from. And you start judging But you've got to put that to the side. You've got to look at the Spirit because if what I say, I might be the one that plants the seed. And then somebody 10 months later comes and gets the harvest because it's harvest time. But if I didn't plant that seed, there would have been nothing in that person for anyone to get. They would have just been a barren, barren harvest. There would have been nothing there. So they had to get out of their comfort zone. They had to talk to the Samaritans. They had to minister to them. Verse 39, so there were many of this from the Samaritan village who became believers in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Then they begged Jesus to stay with them, so he stayed then there for two days, resulting in many more coming to the faith in him because of his teachings. So because Jesus was faithful, the disciples were faithful, Many believed in Jesus. And that was just from a conversation. It doesn't, I, nowhere in the story does it say Jesus did a miracle. He didn't do a miracle. He prophesied. He knew what the woman was about. But he didn't do a miracle per se. He didn't turn water into wine. He didn't, you know, heal anybody. He just talked to people. Now, we're called to those things, to heal the people, raise the dead, all of this, but we can talk to people. We can be honest with them, because Jesus was honest with her. And one of the hardest truths that I learned from being a teacher for so long was when you don't know something, don't make it up. (laughs) Don't make it up. 
Because that could be the one opportunity that they get to know about Jesus. If they ask you about something and you don't know that you know that you know, then don't talk about it. Be like, I don't know, I've got to figure that out. They will respect you more in that moment than they would if you would have lied to them. You've got to be honest. People respect honesty because there's not a lot of it in the world. You can just look at our government right now. It's a three-ring circus and a half. They're putting in a fourth one right now. (laughs) We've got to be honest. And if we're doing that, they literally just talked to them and then became believers. We've got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to, it, it can't just, and I'm the world's worst about this, it can't just be a post on Facebook. It's got to be words. It's got to be conversations. It's got to be a relationship. You've got to take that step. You've got to go forth and do something because, again, Jesus sitting at that well, he was tired. He, earlier, I didn't read this part, the Pharisees were already plotting against him because he was, had his disciples baptizing people. He's like, all right, we got a peace. And he leaves to go to Galilee, and he's tired at this point. It says he's weary from his journey, and he's hungry. It's in the afternoon. Y'all know about right now, you're getting starting to get hungry. He's hungry and tired. He, he could have been silent. <laughs> but guess what? He did it. He's like, I'm about my father's work, and he made it happen. We've got to get past what we feel because what we feel is just temporary. It's temporary. Our life here is like this. Eternity is everywhere. This is our life. And I'd like a lot more people's eternity to be good than being like a fire, tormented, because we didn't take that step to just have a conversation. We might be the harvester. We might be the sower. God gives the increase. We've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. I put this in here. It's, it's going to be hard sometimes to talk to some people. Some people are difficult to talk to. You know, they come in and you're just like, Ugh, do I have to talk to her? You know what I'm talking about? You just, oh, you. But you talk to them because the best fish stories have the best catch. The harder it is to catch the fish, the better the story is. You know? If this huge fish just just up in the boat didn't give you a fight, you'd be like, you'd have to make something up. <laughs> you'd have to make something up. But if that thing, oh, I spent an hour trying to get that thing, I was, uh, all of this, it makes a much more exciting story. Jesus is about excitement. But if that thing just plops up there, it's like, oh, yeah, and I, I, I almost broke my line, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he lied and got away. But we've got to put in the effort because that is the best stories. And those stories are blueprints for more people to get set free. For, verse 42. Then the Samaritan said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you told us. But now we've heard him ourselves and are convinced that he is really the true Savior of the world. It's not just what I have to say or Denny or Kenneth Copeland or Jesse Duplantis or Bill Johnson or Stephen Furtick. It isn't us that's going to do anything. We can say it till we're blue in the face, but until people take that step, yeah. it, it's not going to happen. Because, like I said, Daddy didn't get, get me saved. Him and Mama put a lot of word into me, a lot of things of how to live my life. But until I was ready to get uncomfortable and take that step, it wasn't going to happen. I didn't have a real relationship. I saw the relationship through their lives, but I didn't have it. It was over there. It's like, man, does God really talk to them? I lived my whole life thinking that. It's like, well, God talks to them. Why doesn't he talk to me? 
I'm just being honest because <laughs> it, it frustrated me for so long. It's like, why doesn't God talk to me? Why don't I have that same relationship? And then when I gave up, when I stopped struggling, and God's like, I got him in the boat, y'all. <laughs> then I started realizing that I did have that relationship, that he did talk to me. I just thought I was really smart. I really did. I thought all the gr- really good ideas were mine. And God was like, no, that was me. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I did for so long. I didn't know that was God. And he talks to each person a little bit different. But until I had that relationship with him, I didn't realize those things. I didn't know. Because it says right here, but now we have heard him ourselves. We have to hear him ourselves. We have to get people to hear them. It's it's us getting uncomfortable. We've got to sow the seed and reap. There's people that we come in contact with every day. I got somebody in my life right now. Man, I can't wait to see him on fire for God. Cannot wait. He's an awesome guy. And he's a hard worker. Like anytime he's excited about something, man, I I can only imagine when he gets saved how many people he's going to get saved. Like I cannot I cannot imagine. Like he's just that amped up about everything. But it's me planting the seeds, just hanging out with him. Just, you know, saying that I love him. You know, just being there. We, it, it might be uncomfortable because we're, we're bros. <laughs> we're bros. That's how men are. But I've got to be uncomfortable because I don't want to see him go to hell. Right. I don't want to see him to go to hell. Because that, that would hurt. Yeah. That would hurt. Yeah. But it comes down to this. But now we have heard in our, him ourselves and are convinced that he really is the true Savior of the world. We got to start creating real relationships. It can't just be all oh, their my friends on Facebook. I wish them happy birthday on fr- Facebook. Yeah. Okay, I'm the I'm bad about that. It's like I don't talk to people until the birthday pops up on Facebook. Happy birthday! And I only put one exclamation mark. <laughs> you know, if I feel extra guilty, I'll put two more behind there. That really shows that I care about them. <laughs> but we've got to have real relationship. <laughs> Sorry for the guilt, anybody. (laughs) We've got to have real relationships. It's got to go past just these four walls. Jesus wants that. It it said up there, He wants sincere worshipers. And it starts in our heart. If everybody stand this morning. Lord, we just thank You. That we do have a real relationship with you, Lord. That we have an experience with you, God. And that we're not going to take just the crumbs any longer, Lord. We are going to seek after your face, Lord. And that we're going to get uncomfortable with the people around us, Lord. To show them what a real relationship with you looks like. That it's not just lip service, Lord. That it's not just a religious checklist lord any longer but god that it is something that we truly believe in lord that we would stake everything on your existence lord and your love for us god i just thank you right now that that we take that step lord that we don't just sit there any longer in our comfort lord We don't fold our hands. We don't become lazy about this, Lord. But we come after you wholeheartedly with sincere hearts, Lord. God, I just thank you for the time that we've had together, Lord. Just protect everybody and just love on everybody this week, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.